what risks is your supply chain exposed to? And this is ultimately a question about de-risking and how you use intelligence to de-risk. And de-risking from a geopolitical risk standpoint is nothing more than making an informed reorientation of a supply chain using intelligence to find alternatives that connect a company to its customers. It's that simple and it's that complicated. Companies operating in today's global economy really need to get an understanding of the international geopolitical risk landscape. At Infortel Worldwide, we work with our clients on solving risk before it starts. Welcome to the Riskology Podcast. This is a five-part series on geopolitical risk intelligence, where we're looking at managing business risk globally and really understanding the geopolitical risk landscape. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back for our fifth and final episode in the Infratal Worldwide podcast series, Geopolitical Risk Intelligence 2023 Outlook. Today, I'm joined by Ian Oxnavad, and Ian is going to visit with us about supply chain intelligence. So, Ian, first of all, welcome, and thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me today. Thanks for having me. Ian, could you tell our listeners a little bit about your professional background? I am the Director of Geopolitical Risk at Infratal Worldwide. We are a due diligence investigation company and emerging into geopolitical risk intelligence. I hold a PhD in political science. I'm a political scientist and an economist by training. I specialized initially in academia before entering the private sector in issues, basically that combine political science and economics. So things like corporate espionage, economic warfare, money laundering, terrorist financing, things of that nature. Sounds like you've just described a regular business day here in America. (laughs) It's never a dull moment. So I wanted to start off by asking sort of a big picture question of you. From a geopolitical risk perspective, how do you help a company begin to think through supply chain intelligence? How you address supply chain intelligence, it's something that you first have to assess what your exposure is to certain geopolitical risks. So what are your company's risks from the sense of political upheaval, political change, whether it's a change in regime, conflict, or even war? Geopolitical risk for supply chain is something that many firms kind of discovered the hard way, kind of a cold clock to the head in 2020 with the COVID era. So you had the pandemic itself, even when it was in China only, you had a major shutdown and disruption in manufacturing because Wuhan's an industrial hub in China. And then you had, as the pandemic emerged, not only the pandemic itself and the risk from the disease, but you also had disjointed policy responses all over the world, ranging between countries, between different regions, and even at different local levels, right? So you had economic monetary expansion, you had flushing of cash into the economy to keep the economy afloat while people were staying home. So how is that a geopolitical risk? Well, that was ultimately a crisis-based decision to inflate the economy and keep it going from a demand aspect while people were staying home. So you had a supply crunch that laid the groundwork for the inflationary crises that you see all around the world now. You had political and social unrest. You had political polarization. You had riots in different places over different issues. You had an increase in authoritarianism virtually in every country. And you had disruptions to the rule of law. And many consulting firms that deal with this risk mitigation, they kind of came to this conclusion that it's somehow a new thing, that the geopolitical risk is somehow new. And I've heard it talked about how geopolitical risk post-Ukraine invasion in 2022 is a game changer. And that's not actually accurate. Russia first began formal incursions into Ukraine in 2014 ago when they annexed Crimea. So all this goes to say that political risk is not something new when it comes to supply chains. In fact, geopolitical risk and supply chains are very old. The first aspect of knowing how a company can navigate supply chains is the understanding of intelligence, and that requires a broader view. So to kind of reiterate how old this is, it's not something 2022 or even 1945 or even 1914. If you go back to the spice trade and you look at the supply chain for spice trading in the 15th century, you had a nexus going from Gujarat in India to Mamluk, Egypt, and up to the Republic of Venice. And there were diplomatic and economic ties between the three. Now, the Venetians did this very consciously by integrating their economic 
system and shipping with a sort of private sector-based intelligence system. Now, the Portuguese were very conscious of this, and they disrupted this when they made it to India in 1498 and intentionally severed Venice's supply chain advantage by colonizing India and defeating Mamluk Egypt several times in the Indian Ocean. Most people are not aware of that. And if you kind of think about that in the broad view, this sort of intelligence nexus, but also with geopolitical risk and supply chains, they're totally integrated. Contest over supply chains is what drives much of world history. So if companies forgot this, they relearned it in 2022 very quickly, but there was ample warning. So some of this is adopting a mentality of what risks is your supply chain exposed to? And this is ultimately a question about de-risking and how you use intelligence to de-risk. And de-risking from a geopolitical risk standpoint is nothing more than making an informed reorientation of a supply chain using intelligence to find alternatives that connect a company to its customers. It's that simple and it's that complicated. So I would add the business intelligence that the Portuguese successfully used was to not attack the Venetians directly, but to go around the horn and outflank them. So a great example. Since I was in graduate school in the uh, 1979-1980 in Michigan, and there was a lot of talk from auto companies about moving to a just-in-time supply chain. Mm -hmm. And they borrowed, stole, or learned that from the Japanese, brought it to America. And for probably the next 50 years, that was a primary supply chain system. And so I wanted to ask, what alternative supply chain systems are there? Should U.S. companies begin to either move towards them or think about that? The government is talking about different types of supply chain systems, reshoring, et cetera. So how do you help a company perhaps understand their different ways to de-risk the supply chain by moving to a different model? So you bring up a good point with models, and that could be one way that a company de-risks. Ultimately, how you de-risk is going to be determined by the biggest risk that you face. To put this into perspective, are you looking at closing the distance and the reducing logistical costs between a customer and a company. In that case, if you're worried about disruption in China, if war broke out in China, it wouldn't just involve China. You're looking at losing access to suppliers in Taiwan, potentially Japan even. You're looking at disruption in investment. You're looking at monetary expansion as war fighting costs go up. So how can you best reorient your supply chain so that you are not as exposed to these things. Now, it could be as simple as relocating suppliers to Latin America. It could be bringing it home to the U.S. It could be looking at places farther afield. So if your customer base is primarily in the U.S. and you can have a factory anywhere and you're not interested in Latin America, you could look at places in Africa. You could look in someplace like Morocco or even Canada. So sometimes it's logistical distance. But you also have other things to consider, like corruption risk, organized crime presence or terrorism. What's the labor environment like? Are you looking at ESG risks and consideration? And all of those things are going to factor into how you de-risk. So creating that redundant alternative is going to depend on the company and the company's A, tolerance for risk, and also B, what are they looking to accomplish? And what risk are they most concerned about? So you can find alternatives and also ways to economize because I know what you're talking about with sort of the lean manufacturing model of Japanese auto manufacturing. It could be something like that, where you decrease disruption risks by increasing efficiency elsewhere, as well as relocating geographically. Or perhaps accepting more inefficiency in your overall program. Or redundancy, yeah. Because that's ultimately survivability, is redundancy. So let me turn the focus just a little bit. If a Clatter customer comes and asks you to help them think through this issue, how do you counsel them in terms of looking at themselves, self-assessing, and to determine what the risks might be, and then helping them to develop a plan to respond to those risks? Could you maybe walk us through those steps? You're talking about something like an intelligence cycle for business. So the first thing is to, A, basically interview a client. Find out what the client's risk exposure is, what are their concerns, what are their goals. And then you sort of gear intelligence around that question. 
And that would include utilizing boots on the ground resources, triangulated analysis, analysis from different sources, because companies can have intelligence failures just like countries can. You want to make sure that you're not just simply telling a client what they want to hear. You also want to tell them things that they may not want to hear and things that they haven't thought of as well. So this intelligence collection triangulates sources, it refines it, it integrates boots on the ground, raw information and data. And that's ultimately what gets collated into an intelligence product. And that will give the client a clear series of pictures and potential opportunities, how they can de-risk. And then the second step of this, if you're looking for an alternative, is to then screen potential alternatives that they want to go into. And this is where it starts to coalesce with due diligence, right? So let's say you're reshoring from China and Taiwan because you're worried about risk and you want to look at sort of a supply chain that runs from Brazil to the U.S. You're going to have other things to worry about at the more micro level. You're going to have to screen potential suppliers, investors, local conditions. So it's kind of a two-step process. And in terms of the actual risk that you're running away from, you want to have a very good ongoing knowledge through warning indicators of what risk is actually developing. If you go back to Ukraine, you had from history, the risk of a Russian invasion. That's pretty clear. But then you have warning indicators, whether it's the invasion of, or the integration of Russian mercenaries in the Donetsk and Donbass regions, whether it's contentious presidential elections, the annexation of Crimea should have been a big one. And intelligence is sort of an ongoing process, both on what running away from and also what you're trying to enter into. So that gives company's legal counsel, its executive, of course, and any other pertinent players within a company, all the information needed to make the right decisions. And then ultimately the decision is up to them. Yeah, that seems like a good point to end this podcast on. I wanted to thank you again, but before we leave, if our listeners wanted any more information on the topics you've touched on, what would be the best place for them to go? Definitely our website, Ambertal Worldwide. Ian, thanks so much. And I greatly look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you for having me.